Can everyone hear me? Great. Hi, my name is Amy. Hi. Cool. Uh, I'm an engineer at Venmo, and I'm an alum of the Recur Center. If you are interested in either of those things, I'd be happy to talk to you about them afterwards. Um, and RC is formerly known as Hacker School. You might know it by that name. And today, I'm going to talk to you about how reviewing code makes me a better programmer. So I want to start by acknowledging that we've all had some pretty frustrating experiences with code review. Like maybe you're coding away on this new like business critical feature and you finally polished all the details and dealt with all the tedious edge cases and you put so much time and energy to it, you like worked late and you're super proud of yourself for powering through it and like making your deadline. And then you open your work up for review and the reviewer's like, you did it all wrong, start over. This has happened to some of us probably and it's clear that there's some breakdown of communication involved here. Uh, maybe you and your, your reviewer have different priorities uh, or different valuations of the costs and benefits of getting changes out quickly, or your reviewer wants you to rewrite code their way but doesn't explain why. But code review isn't always frustrating. It can spawn into this enlightening conversation in which both the reviewer and the author learn how to think more deliberately about code. Once, I was reviewing a pull request that was a rewrite of some legacy code, and the rewrite had no unit tests. And at first, I was pretty skeptical. I thought about just like commenting, being like, add tests, like why are you sending me this? Um, but I also noticed that the code wasn't hooked into production yet, so that kind of piqued my curiosity. And so I asked the author to walk me through his thinking on why there were no unit tests, um, or why he didn't think they were necessary, and it turns out that leaving out tests was a deliberate choice. The author had to, hadn't decided if this was the right implementation yet, so the legacy code was like confusing to understand, and rather than digging through it all and trying to determine what it was supposed to be doing by reading it, he like kind of tried to imitate it, and then was going to deploy this and test it on himself, on his own data, to see does the new code match the old code before writing tests. Um, and the problem here is that if he had guessed the behavior was wrong, he would have written tests locking down behavior for the wrong behavior, and then he would have had to rewrite all of them all over again. So this conversation was enlightening for both me and for the author. I learned a new way to think about testing strategies. Um, previously, my approach was to dig through the trenches of the legacy code to deduce what the correct behavior was, and then try to replicate that. And that can be a huge time and brain suck. And this conversation gave me a new tool in my engineering arsenal. I could observe the correct behavior of legacy code by testing it out on production-like data. And this is also enlightening for the author because I asked them to make an explicit thought, or to make explicit a thought process that was previously implicit to them. And all of us that have taught know how informative this process can be for the teacher. So what makes code review frustrating? And can we as authors or as reviewers do anything about it, make it less frustrating? And what makes code review enlightening? And how can we learn more from code review and make more of our reviews enlightening? So this talk is an attempt at answering these questions. And in order to aid the discussion, first we'll uh, make concrete what the responsibilities of a reviewer are. And then we'll discuss each of the, those responsibilities and try to reduce the effort that we need to spend on the less enlightening ones. And once we free up some of our reviewers' time, then we can discuss tips for getting more value out of code review for both authors and reviewers. So by the end of the talk, I hope to share with you some tips that I've learned for receiving better code reviews, becoming a better reviewer, and getting more value out of code review. First, let's agree on what the responsibility of the reviewer is. So the first responsibility is understanding the change. Um, answering like, what problem is this pull request solving and why. Keeping the code compliant. So is the code like, pet bait compliant or does it comply to whatever coding standards your organization has. Finding bugs and reducing risk. Whether that be security risk or risk that it will just like, blow up your application. And then ask clarifying questions and offer suggestions. And these last two are really where the learning happens. So what I want us to try to do is figure out how we can reduce the time that your, your reviewer has to spend on these first three 
responsibilities and maximize the time that they can spend on the second two, which is really where uh, we can all learn more. So the first responsibility of a reviewer I've listed is to understand the change. And if your author doesn't give you much context to understand what change they're making and why, the reviewer can end up spending tons of time digging through the code, trying to reverse engineer the purpose of the pull request. But the author has all of that information in their head already. So all they have to do is communicate it to the reviewer. So let's move that responsibility onto the author. So as an author, give context. This is my first tip for authors. You can help your reviewer by giving them everything that you have already in your head um, to help them understand the change that you're making. And the three ways that you can do this on GitHub that I found to be most effective are the description of the pull request, um, having an informative commit history and commit messages, and using doc strings and comments in your code. So make sure at the very minimum you answer the questions, what problem is this pull request solving? And what effect does the pull request have on users? And when I review code, if the author doesn't answer those two questions, I pretty much immediately ask them and then close the review and then I'll pick it back up again once they answer them for me. And to make informative commit history and commit messages more concrete, here are two examples of commit messages I've written in the past. So this first one says, function routing with three exclamation marks. And you can tell I was like really excited about this commit, um, like three exclamation marks worth of excitement, but you can't really tell what it is. And it also doesn't help, you can't see it here, but this commit was like 700 lines diff and like across multiple files, and they don't seem to be logically connected at all, so it's really hard to understand what's going on. And then time, you know, maybe a year passed, and I got a lot better at writing commit messages. The second one gives us lots of information. It tells us what I'm doing and why, and has a link to more information. So that makes the job of the reviewer uh, much easier. What I'm doing is no longer a mystery to them. So this kind of brings me to my next tip for authors, which is make small changes. Um, and this could, there could be an entire talk on how to have an informative git history and commit history. Um, and it's easier to understand the diff if the diff is small. I, I remember seeing this tweet about how if you submit a PR with 700 line diff, the reviewer will be like, looks good to me. Uh, but if you give the same reviewer a PR with a one line diff, they'll find 700 pieces of feedback for it. And this has been pretty true for my experience in code review. And more feedback means more opportunities to learn. Okay, so we've removed understanding the change off of the reviewer's plate. The second responsibility I listed is keeping code compliant. But you know what's better than humans at this? Computers! Use linting tools. Um, automated linting tools. So at Venmo, we use Pilot and Flake, Flake 8, and we run our linting checks in three different places, uh, in our text editors, and a pre-commit hook, so the commit will fail if you have linting errors, and with our test suite when we submit PRs. So that's like part of our continuous integration. Um, and the test will fail if you have linting errors. So then the reviewer doesn't even have to like look through for linting errors, it's great. Um, so these tools combined help us keep our code compliant before the code review process even starts. So then the third responsibility of the reviewer, and the last one that I consider to be sort of a barrier to learning, is find bugs. Humans also aren't that great at finding bugs through reading code. It's a really hard thing to do. Um, and adding automated linting helps pick up some easy to catch bugs, you know, syntax errors, name errors, stuff like that. Um, but not all of them. And to help catch bugs, uh, we can also add tests and do a better job of QAing our code and saying what plan we have to QA our code. So first, write tests. Um, so most of us realize the benefit of good test coverage is not a thing that I probably have to explain to you. Um, but it might not be obvious that better test coverage also helps take pressure off of your reviewer and allow it frees them up to spend more time looking at the more important things. So um, in addition to continuous integration at Venmo for our test suite, we run a test coverage report that also shows statement coverage of the diff for every PR. And this is calculated using coverage.py. 
Um, so we can quickly tell if a line of code isn't executed in our suite, and that helps the job of the reviewer um, a lot. So they also mentioned QAing your changes. So it's also a lot quicker to tell if code is buggy by running it rather than reading it. Um, so similarly to writing tests, having a plan for QAing your code and communicating that plan to your reviewer gives your reviewer more confidence that you'll catch more bugs before hitting production. So they have to worry about that less. This can save your reviewer time and energy and free them up to focus on more important things. So another thing that I regularly do for riskier changes is uh, then when we have this infrastructure for like feature flags, like feature ramping, feature toggling. Um, and so if I have a risky change, I'll wrap it in a feature flag, turn it on for me, and then QA it so that it won't affect other users or it's less likely to affect other users if things go wrong. So this helps us reduce risk of your change. So in summary, my tips for authors for removing some of this work off of the reviewer's plate is give context, make small changes, use linting tools, write tests, and QA your changes. So adding this little bit of work for the authors and adding some dev tooling can help us take pressure off reviewers so they can focus on asking questions and giving feedback. And those two responsibilities are most likely to result in learning. So now that we have more time to do this, let's figure out what to do with this time. Um, Let's talk about how to get the most out of code review once we're focusing on these two things. So first we'll talk about this from the perspective of authors and then we'll talk about it from the perspective of reviewers. Okay, let's talk about authors. Um, so one of the most common causes of frustration uh, in review that I've seen is a review at the wrong level of detail. So going back to my example at the beginning, if you're like 90% done with your work and your reviewer suggests a completely different implementation, they're probably giving you a review at a level of detail that isn't too helpful for you. On the other hand, if you open up a PR with a draft of a new design and you're like 30% done, it's entirely appropriate for the reviewer to suggest a diff different implementation. Might not be appropriate for them to leave a bunch of comments that are like white space. Like, I don't care about that, I'm 30% done. So this brings me to my first tip for authors. Tell your reviewer how done you are. This will enable them to give you the type of review that you want. It can also be super helpful to communicate other things like how urgent the change is to deploy and the impact of the change on your users. Um, and it's funny how much of these tips really just boil down to better communication between the two individuals. My next tip for authors is to ask for specific feedback that you want. So lately I've been specifically pointing out things that I don't like about my code to get some feedback from my reviewers on it. Um, I'll leave comments like, I really don't like this name, does a more descriptive one come to your mind, or this function doesn't seem to be at the right level of abstraction, do you have any suggestions on refactoring it? And I'll get exactly the kind of feedback that I'm looking for. Uh, my next tip is get feedback early and often. Uh, this is also a newer trick I've been trying, um, and I use this to combat perfectionism, which is the thing that I struggle with. Uh, so I have this voice in my head that tells me, Amy, people pay you money to write programs. Your programs should be great. They should be perfect. So then when I write code, I decide it's horrible, and then I scrap it, and then I start over, and then I'll write the code again, but a different way, and then decide that that's also horrible, and then scrap it, and then start over again, and I was doing this with a project at work recently, and I started over from scratch like four times. Um, I couldn't agree on how to represent the data that I was working with and what level of abstraction the API should be for processing the data. And ultimately, I realized that I could propose a rough draft as a PR to get some initial feedback. And this is like groundbreaking for me. It was okay for me to like show someone else my messy work, and then ask them for feedback, and then I could make it better. So this helped me combat my perfectionism, because while the code was still incomplete, it could be perfect. I, I was allowed to be imperfect. And after an iter iter iterative process of getting review maybe three times um, for this work, I um, ended up getting a pretty good final product. Um, so now we're getting feedback early and often, but I also want to urge you to not work too far upstream. Um, and this is 
really tempting to do when you're under lots of pressure to get work done quickly. Um, a couple of my colleagues were like furiously coding away this new feature that we had a deadline for, and they used this feature branch. And every once in a while, they would cut the branch and um, open up what they had so far for review, but then they would keep working upstream of that. And they wouldn't stop programming. And they didn't tell their reviewers that they were doing this either. And so the reviewer like, tried to do their job and tried to give them good feedback, but every time they suggested a change or a way to improve the code, it would also be tons of extra work for them because then they would have to implement those changes upstream too. It ended up in like tons of merge conflicts and was a huge pain. Um, so this caused loads of friction on both sides. And there could have been less frustration all around if the authors had communicated that they were a little rushed and were already working upstream. Then maybe the review would have been done faster or the reviewer would understand more the cost of implementing the changes that they were suggesting. And it would also help the reviewer um, understand that they needed to be quicker. Um, which also brings me to my uh, next point for authors or tip, which is get a micro yes. So a bit of an aside here, in a workshop that I was in on giving and receiving feedback, uh, Tanya Luna from a company called Life Labs New York suggested that the first step to delivering feedback is to get a micro yes. And it's a really small thing. Um, the way that you do this is you ask a colleague if they have a minute to discuss a topic that you want to give them feedback on. And if they say yes, then they've consented to having that discussion with you and they're less likely to get defensive during the conversation, and more likely to be engaged in that discussion with you. So for code review, I like asking the reviewer if they have bandwidth for a review, um, especially for sort of a more complicated one. And if they say yes, then they've consented to spe uh, spending the time it will take to give you quality feedback. And if they're low on bandwidth, then maybe they'll say no, and you can help avoid those situations um, in which code review takes forever, which would have helped our upstream authors in the story before. So my last tip for authors is to welcome questions. Um, this one's a little bit different. So I personal, personally am way more likely to feel comfortable asking questions to my colleagues who have historically welcomed questions from me in the past. So some of my colleagues have literally said to me, I love the questions that you ask, and I am a creature of positive reinforcement, so I will just keep doing that thing that they love. Um, and one way that the, uh, and so I guess building an environment that values learning and welcomes questions is outside the scope of code review too, right? It spans all throughout the ways that you interact with your colleagues. And one way that the Recurse Center fosters this environment for learning that they have is by enumerating some social rules, which are lightweight guidelines for behavior that are disrupt disruptive to learning environments. So a good example is their social rule against feigning surprise. So uh, we can kind of intuitively understand what this means, but let me give an example. So let's say someone's talking about compilers, and you dare to ask what a compiler is. And someone responds by going like, gasp, you don't know what a compiler is? And that kind of comment isn't helpful for the discussion or the conversation, and it's not helpful for learning. It's only helpful to try to make you internally feel a little bit better about yourself. Um, so what happens at RC as a result of having these rules, experiment conducive to asking questions is magical. I learned more rapidly at RC than I did anywhere else, largely because I was free to admit when I didn't know something and free to ask questions. So in summary, my tips for authors are say how done you are, ask for specific feedback, get feedback early and often, but don't work too far upstream, get a micro yes, and welcome questions. So now let's talk about reviewers. First, I want to acknowledge that reviewing code is hard. Asking questions is hard, like we just talked about, and admitting that you know something is hard. So maybe the code is confusing to you and hard to follow, or maybe the author is using a design pattern that you're not too familiar with, but asking questions in code review when you don't understand something is one of the top ways that I've learned to be a better engineer and programmer. And I wouldn't have had that enlightening conversation with my colleague about testing that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk if I didn't ask questions when reviewing code. So similar to our discussion with authors, my first tip for reviewers is review at the right level of detail. 
So if the author says they're 30% done, treat the work like a draft and give feedback on the design and architecture at a higher level. And if the author says that they're 90% done, try to focus more on the details. If you struggle with finding feedback to give on code review, also as an aside, uh, I have a link at the end of my talk with a blog post that I wrote on ask, uh, questions that I ask myself to brainstorm ideas for feedback to give on uh, code reviews. My next tip for reviewers is if the code is confusing, it's probably a problem with the code, uh, not with you. And if it's not, then it's an opportunity to learn. So especially for newer reviewers, it's really tempting to approve a pull request even if you don't understand every line. Um, so you rationalize this by thinking like, they know what they're doing, I trust them, I'm sure it's all good. Uh, but if the code is confusing, it's probably a problem with the code, not with you. Um, ask questions to grow your understanding and ask the author to clarify themselves in code. It will probably be confusing for the next reader that comes along too. The worst case is that you'll help the readability of the code and the best case is that you'll learn something new. My next tip is beta test your feedback. So when I started out giving code review, I was also pretty scared to leave feedback or make suggestions. I was worried that I'd get the tone wrong and I'd be condescending or that I'd sound stupid or I'd think, who am I giving this more experienced person feedback? Like, they know what they're doing. I've, I don't know anything. Um, so in order to get over this fear, I tried beta testing my feedback. And what I'd do is I'd ask a colleague that I trusted if my feedback was reasonable, if there was anything that I could do to make it better. And uh, I would do that before I would leave a comment on their PR. And this helped give me confidence that the feedback that I was giving would actually be useful and would actually make the code better. And it also helped me get better at writing feedback. And my last tip for reviewers is when you're giving a suggestion, communicate the why, not the how. So let me give a couple examples here um, to illustrate this. An example of communicating the how would be use this iter tools function instead. A more helpful way to communicate this feedback would be to communicate the why by saying something like, coercing this data into lists will pull all the data into memory at once, and depending on how much data we're working with, that might not be a good idea. This iter tools function will pull only one chunk of the data into memory at a time, right? So you're telling exactly why you're suggesting this alternative approach. And communicating in this way helps share the way you think about code and what trade-offs you're considering. And this can help your author significantly. It's also respectful of your colleagues as smart individuals to do the best with the information that they have at hand to tell them why to make a change and not how to make a change. So in summary, for reviewers, my tips are review at the right level of detail. If the code is confusing, it's probably a problem with the code, not you, or it's an opportunity to learn. Beta test your feedback and communicate the why, not the how. So at the beginning of the talk, I told you I would give you tips on receiving better reviews, becoming a better reviewer, and getting more value out of code review. And I hope that now you have some ideas on how to get more out of code review at work tomorrow. Um, and before I end, I want to say a quick thank you to my friends, Julia, Kamal, Sasha, Tanya, and Jesse, who all helped me considerably in putting together this talk and brainstorming tips. Um, here's where you can find me on the internet, and thank you. Um, and I will post these slides online. I have some resources at the end. Uh, I'm not going to do a Q&A, but if you have questions for me, I'll wait outside, and you're welcome to come up to me and talk to me about whatever you'd like. Thanks.